Hello everyone and welcome to the next in our series of interviews. Now we're going to do something a little bit different this week because so far we've spoken to lawyers who have different roles, who've shared with us about those roles and the characteristics and the traits that they think make make a good person to fit that position. But this week we're going to be talking to Phil and Samaya, who are both specialist legal recruiters, um, to get really, I think, a different viewpoint. So the viewpoint of someone who is recruiting for senior legal people. Now, both Phil and Samaya have worked as lawyers in the past, so they know lawyers really well, and that's even before their recruitment career in legal. But I think they're going to have a lot to share with us about how people can start planning for their career future and how what, what, what I've learned from both of them over the last few months speaking to them is that it's not always about right now is the time I need to find a new job or I want to find a new position I'll go and talk to a recruiter but how maybe they can be involved a lot earlier than that in terms of your career planning and what it is that you're looking for and how they can maybe even give you a different perspective as well. So that's all I sort of wanted to say, because I know they've got plenty to say. Um, so shall we start with, um, with Samaya, if that's all right? Ladies first and, and all of that. Um, if you wouldn't mind just sort of introducing yourself, you know, maybe a tiny bit about your history up to, to your position now, um, and maybe a little bit about the sorts of lawyers you tend to work with. Yeah, sure. So um, Samaya Ozani, I'm the um, founder and director of Mimosa Fleur, which is a um, largely partner headhunting organisation in London. Um, that was founded in September of 2016. Um, I left practice in, so I was a divorce lawyer for seven years before moving into recruitment at a firm in London. Um, and I think principally my reasons were leaving were because I felt that actually it, it wasn't going to give me the work-life balance that I was hoping for um, and I think looking around me I didn't have enough sort of female role models out there that were partners and successful lawyers but also having a healthy home work balance. Um, in terms of um, the people I work with now so principally senior associates counsel and partners um, I specialize in four sectors so litigation and arbitration private clients, so private clients and family, um, employment and um, sports and media. Um, I find work actually from this side of the fence now fascinating. It's very interesting to see how law firms, firms are run as businesses and, and, you know, seeing aspects of their structure and operations that you don't get to see when you're sort of just very busy, head down, fee earning all the time. Um, and I try to make sure that a significant portion of my work focuses on responsible recruitment. So looking at things like gender and BAME policies, when I'm approaching candidates, when I am retained by firms to set up a small team or find them a partner and say an associate. Um, and so I try to keep that at the forefront of my mind, but also my clients when working as well. Mm, that's really interesting actually that's something you and I haven't talked about I don't think in any detail that you're you're trying to have that eye on diversity as well when you're recruiting e even perhaps when your clients haven't given you that brief that's just something that's important to you I think that so I, I'm a teaching fellow at UCL as well and um, when I was teaching there in 2012 2013 um, a significant portion of the way we used to teach undergraduate family law is by focusing on sort of the gender discourse and actually looking at that now you can see that I mean I don't know if Phil you may agree with me but when you're trying to fill a brief for a client obviously you need to meet that brief as much as you can um, but sometimes there are when speaking to clients lazy assumptions and unconscious bias which is sort of then steering you in one direction and you have to sort of get them to recalibrate slightly and start thinking about actually if they're slightly more dynamic in their thinking, they could still get someone who fits the brief and does, you know, does a damn good job for them, but might not be what, what they had in, in mind initially. Yeah. Oh, no, that's brilliant. Yeah. Well, we've got loads more questions, but I'm going to let Phil do his, his intro as well. Um, so you're right, Phil, to share with us a little bit about yeah. your history to now and the sorts of people you work with? Yeah, sure. Uh, yeah, my name is Phil Jepson. Um, I uh, set up a legal recruitment business in Manchester in 2004. Um, prior to that, I spent 15 years or so working as a lawyer. Um, I was a partner at three different firms 
in the top 50 and a fourth firm as well. So I was partner in four different firms before I left. Um, we've been doing this since 2004, so 15 years now. Our business is very much uh, built around, well, two things really. One is helping firms grow their businesses. And about 80% of our work is retained. So that means we're hired by a law firm to solve them a problem. Um, which normally means either a senior person or a team or a, a, a hard to find person in an area where there's a lot of demand and not much supply. Um, and then the rest of the business is about working with lawyers who want to build careers, um, helping them figure out what comes next, what the right move is, um, and then actually helping them to achieve that. Um, the, the diversity thing is interesting, actually, because... Um, I can honestly say that it's it's kind of it's not something that really I consciously think about a lot of the time because I'm thinking about who's the best person for the job. So their their kind of gender, age, race, all that stuff doesn't to me just doesn't matter. It's all about finding the best person for the job. Um, and I've tended to find with the firms we work for, they take that view as well. Um, I have I mean two things I have noticed recently actually. Um, one is that just generally firms are a lot more flexible and this is kind of a spin-off of the diversity thing I think so the idea of people working from home the idea of people working less than full-time um, is a lot more easily accepted than it was say five years ago um, and also we've come across we've got one retained client uh, for whom we have to provide diversity statistics so if they give us a search when we report, we have to tell them how many, what, well, what the gender split is of the people we've spoken to, um, and so that they can then record it at, at their end. So that is, again, that's something quite new. I hadn't come across that before. Mm. Well, there's the old adage, isn't there, that it sort of starts in London and then then comes up. So yeah. you know, perhaps the mayor's seeing it more uh, already in London, but by the sounds of it, it could be on its way more yeah. out into the yeah. region. Hmm. So you mentioned there, Phil, um, about sort of helping um, lawyers with planning their career and with thinking about their future career and things. Would you, because yeah. that came as a surprise to me when I met you and talked to you about this, that recruiters were sort of doing that, because I think, you know, having been in normal practice before and coming across recruiters sometimes, I suppose, in the, the way that people would think you come across mm -hmm. recruiters, um, I certainly wouldn't have thought of you as somebody that you'd come to for advice and, you know, career steps. But that is something yeah. that, that you're seeing now. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's something that that I've always done, really. I just regard it as part of, it's part of, of a service. The, a lot of recruiters just don't do it. A lot of recruiters are very transactional. Um, they're like, you know, like estate agents or, or a lot of other kind of intermediaries in that if you don't want to do a deal right now, they're not interested. All they want to do is find people who want to transact immediately. Um, but for me, and, and uh, I suspect for Samaya as well, actually, given how she's described her practice, we're in the relationship game. Um, so it's all about building relationships. And if you want to build relationships, you need to do that before the people concerned actually need you. So whether it's a firm or whether it's an individual, I'm always very happy just to meet and talk to people because what you're doing is just building a relationship. And at, at some point, if you like each other, something will come out of it. Um, and there's definitely a gap in the market that for this type of, there's a need for this type of advice. People are not getting it. People do want it. I did done something recently with the Manchester Young Solicitors Group I did a presentation to them and made an offer there to give career counselling basically to, to anyone. To, I said I'd give five sessions. I got five people very quickly who wanted to do it. We did the five sessions and the feedback's been tremendous actually. So it shows that from those people who want to build a career, they do value this type of advice. I suspect they just don't realise they can get it. But it's going to the right people because if you go to most standard recruiters they wouldn't be interested other than well where do you want to move to um people like us are different because i say we're more about the long term and relationships i say so it sounds like some is the same yeah well certainly i mean I'll, I'll ask her if she wants to add anything to that in a second but that, i mean that's why i asked you both to come and do this because having known you both over the last sort of you know oh, i don't know nearly a year probably with both of you i've been talking to you 
that's what I see that you both have in common. And it did surprise me for recruitment agents. And as you say, that my next question would have been, are others doing it? And what, what you seem to be mm. saying is not many are. Um, so yeah, hopefully, obviously, this will be a good introduction for people to know that there are uh, recruiters out there, like, like the two of you, who have a different approach. Did you want to add anything to that, Samaya, before we go to the next question? Um, I, no, I think what, what I am likely to contribute is actually part of question three, so I'm, I'm oh. happy to press on. <laughs> oh, excellent, excellent. So, um, one thing I wanted to touch on with you both, because whenever I talk to lawyers about their careers and what their options are, I get such a, a common thing about in-house. Mm -hmm. they, they seem to think that in-house is, is, if you like, the holy grail of work-life balance. So if I want a better work-life balance, I want to look for an in-house position. Now, I know from speaking to, to lots of different lawyers that sometimes that's, that's not the case. You know, it's not always that just because you're in-house, you're going to have a better work-life balance, etc. But I just wondered what, what you both saw about that. What, you know, what advice do you have for people who, who might just come to you straight away and say, right, I want to move to an in-house position? You know, is it that simple? Or is it? Is there more to it than that? Um, do you do you want to kick off, Samaya? Yes, of course. Yeah, and um, I think I mean it's a, it's a very good question, and I think you're right. There's certainly um, a perception that that in house is the holy grail. I have to say, generally speaking, and certainly at the senior end of the market. So when I'm speaking to senior associates, counsel, or indeed even partners. Um, there seems a general consensus that actually it is easier to maintain and find work-life balance in-house. The quid pro quo of that, of course, is that the financial rewards aren't always the same. And sometimes you have to expect to get a little bit more operationally involved in a business so that, you know, you're not you're not able to deal with the black letter of the law every day as much and you are not living and breathing, you know, the work that you trained to do and the client contacts, of course, virtually reduces to zero um, you also can sometimes find yourself in situations where you know some quite interesting and complex work lands on your desk but you're subsequently forced to, to then outsource that to another law firm but if work-life balance is what you're looking for the reality is and I'm not I'm not a you know I don't work in the in-house market at all but if, if that is what you're looking for generally speaking it is easier to find in-house um, that said the more you climb that career ladder and the more senior one becomes in their career, the more they are able to then control the hours and the working patterns that they have to. So then there's, you know, it's worth being mindful to that, I think. Um, and there are, of course, certain skills that are, you know, I suppose the skills are more transferable or indeed more conducive to moving in house. So if you're an employment lawyer, it's very easy to move in house. If you're a commercial lawyer or a corporate lawyer or generally a transactional lawyer, it's much easier to move in house. Indeed, even now, I'd probably say if you're a private client lawyer, um, particularly in the tax space, it's easier to move in house. You can work for family offices across the world. There are other areas um, where that's much harder. So the disputes lawyers when we're struggling to do that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I think um, I liked your point there that actually, um, as you become more senior in your role, you have the opportunity to take more control of your career. And I always try and encourage people to do that anyway. Mm -hmm. So yes, it's not a question of just, yes, in-house will tick that box for you. Sometimes it's, you know, what can you do already with, with where you are in your career rather than, than changing it maybe. Yeah, and, and your practice area as well. I think that also certainly with a lot of my clients now, they are, they are, you know, I think less impervious to the fact that if they want to retain really good people, um, particularly people that are returning from maternity leave or people that want to, you know, be around at home a bit more, then agile working of some description needs to be taken seriously. And, and that can sometimes offer you the work-life balance that people, you know, assume they'd get in-house. Yeah. Super, thank you. So Phil, same question to you. Do you do you place people in house very much? Is it a question uh, you get often? No. Oh, we get asked it. We get asked it quite a lot. Um we don't do it. Um I I have some quite strong views about this. So I'm glad this was on the list actually. Um yeah. what I mean the first thing uh, I, I agree with a lot of what Sunny has said. Um I mean, in a way, it's not as simple as people make it out because the phrase in-house covers a multitude of sins. Um, it's not as easy as people think 
it's not it doesn't automatically give you the easy life that people think and um i mean the summary of what i often say to people is if if you want to be a lawyer work in private practice if you're not bothered about being a lawyer and you want a job go in house which is pretty much what samaya said um in house has a whole range of problems and issues that can be associated with it that can create tremendous problems for people um, because often you're stuck in a business as the lawyer which means a number of things one is that you're stuck with that business and if it turns out there's something wrong with that business if the morals and principles of the business are less than you um, expect um, or if the culture is weird you're stuck with it um, as Samaya said, you have to deal with whatever lands on your desk. A lot of in-house lawyers end up just managing external providers a lot of the time, um, which, you know, it's, it's a skill set, but it's not about being a lawyer. Um, and it doesn't, it's not necessarily flexible in the way that people think. I mean, sometimes right, you don't have an hours target. You don't have a billing target. So people think that's great. But then on the other hand, you're no longer a, a revenue generator, you're a cost to the business. So being treated as a cost to the business is a completely different experience to being treated as a revenue generator. Um, the business is not about you, you're just ancillary. So it, it's, I think for some people, they're quite unfortunate experiences moving in-house. And actually these days, I, I disagree that you can't get flexibility in private practice from the start because you can. The thing is, you need to seek it. You need to seek it out and you need to demand it and you can get it. Um, once you've got your trailer, the hard bit is the training contract. Once you've got your training contract, once you've got that under your belt, from then on, you can pretty much choose your own path. And there's loads of firms that offer flexible working. There's loads of firms that offer part-time working, whatever stage you're at you just this is where people like me and Samaya come into it because we can guide people in that direction if that's really want to, where they want to go so we're talking to someone for example at the moment who's a partner in a big firm um working um 80 percent of the time so four days a week we're looking at her moving down to a, a, a second tier firm um where the full-time lawyers in the second tier firm are expected to do less hours than she is at 80% in the big firm. <laughs> so she can become full time with a bit of flexibility mm. in a second tier firm and be expected to do less than she's doing part time mm. where she is now. So it's all out there. I mean, if you want to be a lawyer, be in private practice is, is so it's then it's, you know, what floats your boat? Are you trying to get out of the law and into management or do you want to be a lawyer? Um, if you want to be a lawyer, it's all out there for you, whatever kind of shape, size, culture, work stream, whatever you, you want, it's all out there. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I really like that. I like both of your answers to that because I think I think it does answer the question, which is if people are saying in-house is the holy grail for work-life balance, we're all saying, well, not necessarily, you know, don't just yeah. take that assumption um, because, yeah, you know, I think what you're both saying there is the flexibility is there if you look for it, if you're willing to insist on it, um, you know, make it a non-negotiable. The more senior you get, the more non-negotiables you can have personally, because, you know, the, uh, the fact is, I think that the senior level lawyers are quite in demand. You know, there's, there's yeah. obviously lawyers leave. Um, the profession in quite high numbers as they get more senior and therefore those that senior ones that are left are going to have mm. you know the, the yeah. pick of the jobs really and the yeah. conditions yeah the bottom line is if you've got clients and if you've got practice you can get what you want <laughs> because mm. that's the that's the determining factor if you've got clients and you've got a practice then you can set your terms yeah yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. I would agree with that. And and just to sort of, um, you know, for anyone who is thinking about in-house, um, and, and I know we, we had somebody, um, our first speaker, Claire, 
who's, who's done um, Derbyshire County Council for, for nine, ten months. And um, it definitely has its pros and cons. And I think for the right person, it's it's really good. Um, you know, if you're very commercially minded and you want to be involved in the business and, and you know, as you say, more of a business advisor almost even than, than a lawyer, then then it's great. Um, but I know what a lot of people have told me is, you you know, you are you are the one stop shop, if you like. So you have to have that confidence that you can pick up anything, you know, whether it's from a, a property to potentially a commercial contract or whatever, they, they want your advice on it. So, you know, you have to be the sort of person who's ready to sort of turn your hand to, yeah, to anything right. really. Yeah. And also you're the person who says no to stuff. You're the person who stops them doing stuff that they want to do. And, and that's, that's not easy. Yeah. So it does suit a certain sort of personality, I think, rather than just a, a, rather than what some people might think is, it, is it, it's a career move at a certain stage in their career. Whereas I think it's more of a personality fit. Yeah. yeah. I think in some disciplines, if you do a, a year or so in house in the early stage of your career, that's fine. You can get away with that. That enhances your CV. But beyond that, um, once you go into it, it's very easy to get stuck in it. And it's harder, the longer you've been doing it, the harder it is to move back. Um, similarly, with private practice, the longer you've been in private practice, the harder it is to then move in house. So, you know, you need to make the call relatively early on, I think. Yeah, yeah. No, no, that's really interesting. Thank you both for that. I think, uh, I think that'd be really useful for people. Um, so our next question is, um, many lawyers still see progression to partnership as their career aim. Now, not everyone, I appreciate, and I think it's even changing, you know, quite rapidly, that's starting to change. But I do think for most lawyers still, the sort of um, ideal is to get to partnership. So what advice do you have for lawyers who want to progress, even from an earlier part of their career you know so it's not just oh well now i'm on the partnership track or now i'm going to go for promotion in the next year what should people be thinking about even earlier on in their career um should we start with you phil this time okay yeah um i i don't subscribe to the fact that people don't want partnership anymore and um, i think a lot of people have it beaten out of them by firms who make it so difficult to get but that's the firm's fault it's not doesn't speak to the individuals and their ambitions and aspirations. I think young lawyers do aspire to it. Um, and I've seen some of that recently. And um, I think, and if you're going to aspire to it, what I'd say is don't be shy from the day one, you walk in through the door as a, as a first year trainee, um, you should have a plan. So it's figuring out how it works here. What's the system? What are the criteria at all the different levels? What have I got to go through? and then build a plan to get there so that as you go forward, you work into something and it's not just a random exercise. Um, when, when I joined Erwin Mitchell as a, as a, what was then an article clerk, so it took him a long time ago, but um, I knew on the first day I walked in through the door that I wanted to be an equity partner in that business. Um, I just knew, and that was because I'd been interviewed by some of the equity partners and I just thought, I want to be like you. So then it was a case, okay, so what have I got to do to, what have I got to do to get that? Um, and it took me seven years to do it from day one. Um, but everything I did over that time pretty much was geared towards that objective, which is one of the reasons why it happened in that, in that time frame. Um, it's harder these days. There's more hurdles. There's more steps. You've got to be more resilient. You've got to be more determined. But then... On the other hand, the caliber of people who are entering the profession at the bottom is higher than it was you know, in my day. Um, you know, they're better educated and they're better trained up to that point than we were. So they're better equipped for it. They know more about what they're getting into. Um, so, you know, I think they should, if, if, if those people at that stage in their career don't aspire to get to the top of their firm in their profession and then in the nicest possible way, what the hell are they doing there? Because uh, this one of my quotes, being a lawyer is a great career, but a terrible job. <laughs> you know, because it's not, you know, it's not easy. There is a lot of work involved. There are bad times. And the thing that gets you through it is the why it's the, I'm here because there's a greater purpose of some sort. And that's what the career thing is. 
um, that's what gets you through. If it's just a job and you're just doing it for the money um, and you have nothing, no aspirations beyond that, then it's a horrendous job. So, um, you know, I would always encourage young lawyers to, to go for it, um, to, to, you know, to make a plan and to shoot for the moon. They can always change it later. They can always modify the plan. But let's say if you're not doing that, then I really don't know why you're there. And firms should be picking people who, who de can demonstrate that. Because again, if, if they don't do that, why are they having trainees in the business? So um, I think they do have ambition. I just think that, let's say sometimes it just gets beaten out of them. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I love your quote, by the way. I may have to ask you if I can license that from you because that is amazing. I, I'm going to think about that a lot in terms of my own life because I'm thinking that explains a lot why I got to about 35 and thought, I don't know if I want to do this anymore because once you've got to the thing you set yourself, it's like, well, what is the greater plan now? What is the plan? And, you know, we, we do need a plan, don't we? And I, I think law is so good at sort of mapping out for us, you know, from training contracts to job to, to you know, getting qualified yeah. and then choosing your area and everything. You're on that track. And then at some point you stop and look around and go, well, what next? <laughs> yeah. Um, so, yeah, yeah, I really, really like that quote because you're right. When, once you've sort of ticked those boxes and it's just a job, it is a tough job. Mm. <laughs> yeah, it is horrendous. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I love that. And um, yeah, I think I, I like the way you picked up that point, actually, you know, about whether people actually want to go for partnership. A lot say they don't. But then I do ask the question. I think it was an event Samara and I were speaking at, actually, either earlier this year or at the end of last year, about when people say they don't want partnership, is it what they're actually saying is, I don't want to make the life sacrifices I perceive necessary to be able to go for partnership. Whereas actually, if it wasn't about sacrifice I probably would want that role ultimately um, so if you know if what we're saying is that more flexibility potentially the more work-life balance whatever that means to people does exist now then partnership doesn't have to perhaps be the choice that it used to be yeah I mean the, the only thing I'd say about that is it's all about creating value so if, if you if you're creating value you you have a right to expect a share of that will come back to you in money and status what you can't expect is the money and status without creating the value so you can figure out as a lawyer how you do that whether it is just grinding out the hours or whether it's getting in high margin work you know less hours but higher bills whatever but you've got to create the value there's no way around that um, the point is that if you if you don't have the aspiration to do that you're in you shouldn't be there um, so, you know, if, if you want to be a lawyer, then be a lawyer. But if you, if you don't have the ambition, you don't have the aspiration, you don't have the drive, then, you know, go and do something else because you're just going to make yourself and everyone around you very, very miserable. Mm. I think I just on the, the sort of the, the partnership issue and, and what um, Phil was just discussing, I think I, um, I agree and disagree to an extent. I agree with Phil entirely when he says from day one of arriving at that firm, you need to be thinking about what's your agenda, what's your strategy, and in which direction you're going to take your career. Um, and certainly I think that from day one, you should be as ambitious as you possibly can. Um, that having been said, I do think that there is something to be said for people that actually just want to be very, very good career associates. And that's why we've started to see in particular three types of roles surfacing on the market. And that is counsel, legal director and professional support lawyers. Because I think the law, the, the law firms now are adjusting to the fact that not everyone does want the responsibility and pressures that come with being a lawyer A. I think B, generally speaking, lawyers are expected to be intellectually and technically very, very good. And sometimes they're not necessarily as good as the business development, client management side. So I've met candidates before who love the intellectual acrobatics, but are very difficult and awkward around clients, or indeed their bedside manner might not be very good. And so for them actually just planning on as a really big biller and fee earner, works very well for them and perhaps being the sort of firm that might reward them for that by giving them you know a bonus which recognizes the origination of their work that that is a option 
Um, but, but I don't think that just because you don't want to become a partner, then law necessarily isn't right for you. And I also think there are different types of partnerships that one can be a part of. There are, are I think there's a bit of a misconception in law in that Generally speaking, lawyers are not very well paid in the grand scheme of things. I, you know, I've got candidates at the moment who are 10 years PQE at you know, very well-known top tier firms in London, who, for example, one of my candidates in the last three weeks has seen his family for three days. And it's a first world problem, it's all relative, but in the grand scheme of things, and this is someone that builds around 3,000 hours a year, he earns 200,000 pounds. I think that that is frankly scandalous actually you know and there are other professions in which you can make a hell of a lot more money but without putting yourself and your family under so much pressure so don't do law because you want to earn good money because actually it's a very small snippet of people largely in the city at certain types of firms that are able to do that but um I, I think it's important people feel that there are options and they shouldn't be made to feel that they are failing if partnership isn't what they're pursuing but absolutely you've got to have a plan as Phil says and you've got to have direction and ambition from the very beginning because it's a very saturated market it's fiercely competitive and the training contract is designed to encourage competition amongst all of the people you know there is a very specific reason why for every partnership application or every trainee contract application there are hundreds and hundreds of people applying um, so yeah you've got to make yourself stand out yeah, absolutely. I think whether people are thinking about partnership or not, it's. It, I think those are good tips, you know, to have a plan, be proactive about your career. You know, it doesn't matter whether you're going to partnership, to, to, to associate, to, to senior, whatever it is, be proactive in your career, have a plan. Um, yeah, absolutely. And, and don't yeah. just pursue partnership blindly either. You know, we, there, was, there was an event that I held on Wednesday and one of the partners, who is a planning partner at Pinsent Masons. Um, I think the youngest partner they've ever had, she was, when I moved her there, she was 29. Um, and it's the top planning practice in the country. And she had 22 interviews for that role. And it took us just under a year to complete that assignment. And she said to you know, the audience, it's absolutely vital that you ask yourself, really, why do I want to be a partner? You know, am I pursuing this blindly because that's just what, you know, I've been institutionalized and that's the message that I've been given. Or is it because I understand exactly what I'll be doing? I know the responsibilities, I know the pressures, and you know it, it, it really is a choice I'm wanting to make. And she said, you know, it's got to be a conscious choice, actually. So make sure you're understanding what it involves from the very beginning. Yeah, I agree with that. I do agree with that. And also, there's a, there's another aspect to that conscious choice thing because um, I, I also. Um, agree Samaya that that yeah not everyone's going to be just the numbers game not everyone's going to be a partner and some people are going to end up as legal directors um of council or or whatever and I think one one way that lawyers do sell themselves short sometimes is that they um they'll just go oh I'm no good at business development so I'm gonna to have to settle for whatever and in fact all of the skills for that you can learn uh, mm -hmm. people are not born as good sales people, well, some people are naturally better at it than others, but people, sales people, business development people are not born, they're made. So you can learn those skills. Anyone can do it. Um, there is a confidence issue. That's probably the big thing actually with lawyers because of their mentality. A lot of them do suffer from a lack of confidence in themselves and what they can achieve. Um, and it's probably, it's a part of our job probably not one that we get paid for, but part of our job is giving people that confidence and self-belief that they can achieve more and that this stuff they can do, they can learn it. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree. And I, 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 I think that that's one of the issues as well, why the figures are so skewed when you look at, you know, the genomics of, of law and why we remain quite depressingly, women remain quite depressively the mm. highest number of entrants into the legal profession. But yet make up, I think it's less than 35% of all partners yeah. Yeah. You know, yeah, in, 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 in yeah. the country. And actually, it's at that sort of stage where when I work with, with senior candidates that I do need a very good professional coach to sort of come in and work alongside me because it's great managing a candidate and being very consultative and coming back to what we were talking about earlier where you 
sort of help an individual map out their career. That that is a key part of our role, and not everyone takes that. Not everyone in the recruitment industry, I think, a takes that seriously, and b knows the market well enough to be able to do that. But you know, we have Phil and I would have a, a vested financial interest in any candidate that secures a role, and of course. You know, lawyers are going to be aware of that. They're very switched on, sophisticated individuals. And so having, you know, somebody that is neutral to that process, that is there to certainly help with, with coaching and um, giving advice and helping to instill that confidence objectively can be really important at, you know, the very integral stages of an interview, you know, a week before a 12 partner panel interview, for example. It, it, it can make the difference between a career changing move and not actually. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. I know that's a conversation I've had with both of you separately is about the, the big issues for people. And, and I know Samir says, you know, specifically for women, confidence is an issue, but, you know, we all meet men who are in the same sort of situation as well. Um, so, yeah, confidence of confidence to know that they are good enough to go for the promotions and, and to move further up and to do the business development, just like Phil said, because to me, that that's, that is a partner's role. You know, partner's role is to manage teams, manage clients, bring in new business. Um, and, and that does take confidence um, and, and many other skills, but they, they can be taught. Absolutely. If that's the person is, is passionate about that and that's what they want their career to be. Then they can learn those skills. Absolutely. We could talk about that question for a whole hour, I think, couldn't we? <laughs> Easily. Uh, so the next one is, um, and, and we've touched on this, I think, probably in the other Ooh. questions is, do you think there are certain personalities or certain characteristics that mean people would suit one sort of role over another? Phil, we'll go first with you. Um... Yeah, it's quite difficult. It's actually quite a difficult one, this, because um, you you clearly, as a lawyer, there are certain basic things which you need to be able to do. So you need your technical skills. And in order to have those technical skills, that means you need certain degrees of uh, personal traits and characteristics that, that lend themselves to those. So you've got to be able to deal with some detail. You've got to be diligent you've got to understand rules and processes and you've got to be capable of following them. And also you need, at least theoretically, you need to have morals, you need to have ethics so that, you know, you stay within the bounds. I know there are well-documented examples of lawyers that haven't, but basically you know, that's, that is the system. So you've got to be, you've got to be capable of doing that. Beyond that, actually though, um, it doesn't matter so much. And you see, you know, you see really, really good business developers who are introverts. Um, you know, you see re uh, within any of the, the, the boxes, you see a quite a broad cross section of people. So um, I don't, I don't think, I, I think people have quite a, actually a quite a wide range of options open to them and it is about what they want. And to the extent that they've got a skills deficit, if there's something they really want to do, they can deal with that. And that's where it is where people like you come in. It's the coaching side, as Samaya said. So um, I think as long as you, you've got the base level of technical ability and the characteristics to build that, then above that, there's room for you in pretty much whichever direction you want to go. I mean, the only thing is some roles have limitations. So as you said, like in-house doesn't have business development. Although actually what it does have is relationship development because you've got to build all your relationships within the business it's just a different different sort so um i think it's um the short answer is actually as long as you've got the baseline then pretty much any sort of person can do anything they want mm. i like that that's good what do you think samir and um, i think i think it depends on whether you're asking me what are there certain characteristics which better suit partner positions or more senior positions or, or whether you're asking me whether certain characteristics can, um, you know, lend themselves better to other careers in the law. I think if it's the latter, Phil has, you know, very effectively dealt with that. I think if you're looking at partner, it's slightly different. And I'm always at a strange juxtaposition with this. I think on the one hand, in theory, there are certain characteristics which will better suit partners um, I think you have to be a very good people manager 
I think you have to be very attuned and alive to management issues before they arise. Um, I think you, you do have to be naturally very good at business development and with clients. And whilst I agree with Phil that those are skills that can be taught, you know, the real rainmakers, you know, the best performing lawyers around are those that have that innate ability to just instill confidence and build that rapport with their clients from the very get go. And the way they do that is, is actually really quite mind blowing. Um, but the reason why I say that I'm at a strange juxtaposition position with this is because there are many, many um, very successful teams and practices out there where there are partners at the helm of things that don't have many of those skills at all, or perhaps just one of them. And that's why you see certain teams that really struggle with hiring. That's why you see certain teams that will have to retain people like Phil and I to go out there and build a new team or find, you know, a very senior person to come in and basically repair the damage that's been done. It's why you see that some firms can't hire for love nor money, notwithstanding how well they may pay. Um, and actually, in terms of the damage that causes to their brand capital, it's very serious. So in theory, yes, there are certain characteristics which would suit themselves better to say someone aspiring to be a partner or a head of a team. But in theory, a lot of the time, law firms will turn a blind eye to that, unfortunately, if, for example, they have a rainmaker that just has very, very valuable clients and they just can't afford or don't want to afford to lose that individual. Yeah. Mm, that's really interesting because I think from my perspective, having seen that in private practice, many of the people that were making it to partnership and equity partnership, dare I say, did lack some of those skills that you're talking about and probably lacked them quite, quite badly in some cases. Um, but yeah, may, maybe the tide is changing or should be changing so that those skills, there are people who naturally have those skills and that's brilliant. And that those who don't, but still, you know, want to fit into that partnership role, you know, if they're willing to, to do that training, to go on that journey, to, to, to mm. uncover some of those skills for themselves in terms of the, you know, relationship building, people management, client, client relationships, all those sorts of things. Um, they can probably improve on what they've got. Let's put it that way. Yeah, and, and I also think that, you know, these sort of people that you say you, you've seen as well, that, that aren't very good at the people management, you'll often find that they will align themselves with, say, a very good senior associate or counsel or legal director, who they'll continue to sort of throw that work at so that that said individual is doing a lot of the non-billable stuff and invariably and this was one of the discussion points that we had on on Wednesday at the how did she do it event was um invariably it is women that tend to be given those tasks I'm afraid and, and, and our advice was you know really keep your eyes and ears open with that because if you're finding significant portions of your day are being taken up with you know management issues and secretarial issues and you know paralegals and trainees that aren't getting supervised etc you should be very alive to the fact that you might be absorbing too much of that non-billable work which is then directly impacting the financial picture you are able to present to people above you and then be aware of how that impacts your partnership journeys and you know your if you get stuck in that type of a role your career journey may not be as linear as you might hope mm. Mm. there's lots of things to think about isn't there lots of things for people to be aware of definitely um, now we're going to go on to the next question because I think this one might be quite fun. Um, you probably get lots of typical questions from candidates um, and I, I've suggested things like, you know, I want flexible working, I want part time working, I'm getting married, I might be starting a family, maybe I'm going for IVF, something like that. Um, you probably get those sorts of, what, what, what sorts of typical questions do you normally get and what's your advice? Samantha, so you're on my screen, so I'm starting with you. <laughs> That's fine. Um, no, I, 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 um, really interesting questions, actually, um, that you raised there. I think a lot of the time you have to really get very close to your candidate for them to feel comfortable and confident enough to raise those issues. But actually, more than ever before, I now have candidates that will say to me exactly that, actually. Um, look, I am really interested. And at any other point, I would have wanted to pursue this. But next month, I'm about to start fertility treatment. Um, and my advice would always be don't allow that to put you off. You know, let's see whether we can have a very honest and open dialogue with, with the client and see what their views are. And I have two partner processes that are ongoing at the moment. One was a retained assignment and one was just opportunistic where 
both clients are pursuing candidates that they know will arrive potentially pregnant and then go off on maternity leave. Um, and as long as there is that logistical, practical infrastructure and support there, um, it can work. So uh, my advice would be, be honest, um, share with the, you know, the headhunter that's representing you in the market, everything you can and together, the two of you can choose what information you have to well, you decide on the information you need to legitimately share and choose which information you feel, you know, you want to share because that's not information you have to share and you shouldn't be forced to. But certainly I think it, the more honest and open the landscape is, the more successful those sorts of hires will, will likely be. Mm. And Phil, what, what do you see typical question wise from, from candidates? What's your advice to them? Um. It's interesting, just, I mean, just dealing with the, the same ground that Samoa has been covering there, um, those, those issues are out there with, with pretty much anyone you talk to, whether, whether it's a man or a woman, um, because um, you know, everyone's got stuff going on outside of work that can impact on what happens inside of work. Um, actually, it shouldn't make any difference. Um, it shouldn't, um, and often where it does, it's more about the candidate. What happens is you get the individual will pull out of a process because they discover they're pregnant. I've had that happen a few times, mainly with women, obviously. But um, um, whereas there was one occasion where I had the same experience that Samaya's talking about, where um, it was a lady, she discovered partway through the process that she was pregnant she made the assumption that that was the end of it. Um, we spoke to the firm and the firm went, that's fine. Um, you know, we want you, she was part of the team as it happened. Um, you know, well, let's, let's figure out the practicalities of it, but it doesn't make any difference from our point of view. So, um, I mean, I think it's keeping this stuff in proportion, really. I think generally the, the it's common sense. So if you, if you're looking at a, a, a role where you want to impress a bunch of people and you want them to hire you, then you behave in ways that are likely to achieve that. So going into the first meeting saying, right, here's my list of demands. I want white chrysanthemums in a pot in my office. I want a green chair. I want a red telephone. Um, oh, by the way, I need six weeks holiday and I need to get paid this. You know, that just doesn't work. Um, Lots of stuff can be achieved. It's just doing it in context and doing it at the right time in the process. Um, so I, I just suggest to people that they apply common sense to this. If it's a role that they want and they need to, yes, they need to be open and honest, but actually some of this stuff shouldn't make any difference. Um, and I mean, legally can't make any difference. Um, it's interesting that the only, the only people I have experienced uh, any gender bias from have been female partners um, yes. who've openly said to me we want a man for this job uh, and which <laughs> you just don't get I mean in my experience blokes don't do that in reverse so it, it's, it's interesting um, I mean I think the, 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 the other questions that candidates ask it depends on the um, experience of the candidate really if they've done it before if they've changed jobs before then you know they'll know the smart questions to ask around the culture of the team how the team's made up how you progress within the team um all that kind of stuff because actually it's the team that's more, most important because they're the people you're going to be working with all the time so they'll ask smart questions about that um where someone is less experienced in the recruitment process you can get all kinds of random, all kinds of random questions. The relevance of which varies from totally irrelevant to just vaguely relevant. Um, but there's, I don't think there's any, there's no two or three single questions that you get every time. Not in my experience. It is quite a wide range of stuff, which mm -hmm. actually is where the experience of, where our experience comes in handy, because it's being able to say to people, oh, "I've seen this before. Don't worry about it." Is yeah. the, you know here's how to raise it if you want to raise it mm. and here's what the answers are likely to be. Mm. And if it's that important to the candidate, 
then they should seriously raise it. So flexible working is really important because they have to do you know, some collection at this time or you know, pick up their mother, you know, a dependent from somewhere. Then by not raising it and just accepting a job in those circumstances is probably likely to cause for the process to unravel yeah. later on. Um, and I think the more we have these open and honest conversations about flexible working and part-time and accommodating different, you know, patterns for people, the more I think adept law firms are going to become at, at dealing with it. Because as I say, I mean, there, are, there is still a lot of unconscious, conscious bias out there. And there is still, you know, some very strange and questionable recruitment practices. I have for one had clients in the past ask me, um, the name of the candidate whilst I've been on the phone to them and they will literally Google search them to get up an image. And I have had a candidate in the past saying, you know, she doesn't look quite right or I'm not sure my clients will, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, I can't actually remember exact phrase to use, but it was suggesting that the clients wouldn't really be particularly impressed. And yeah. Both of those particular candidates were, were, were of black and minority ethnic backgrounds. So, you know, and, uh, what, what can you do unless unless there's actually organizations like phil and i start to be more responsible in the way that we recruit mm -hmm. you know um you'll you'll, you'll be surprised and particularly i think with the larger organizations where there are targets and financial pressures it is easy to fall into the trap of just putting for the candidate that you think is most likely to get the job because they are conventionally on paper the right person but um yeah, not, 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 not always the way, and it's not always the best practice. Hmm. Yeah, so would, would you both um, suggest to people who are going through the process that they are as open and honest as they can be with you as recruiters, and then you can guide them through how open and honest they would then be with, with potential firms? Most definitely, yeah. And I, I just think as well, they're being sensible about what information you share, particularly at the early stage. You know, I wouldn't, actually advise any candidate male or female to go into an interview and say I'm getting married in a month is that going to present a problem because you're just making issues out of non-issues you know um it, it, you know I think in the grand scheme of things most people would assume that you know invariably that's what most people you know will, will have on their agenda at some part of their life but uh, you know, and, and I also actually, and these are my views and my views only, and I, you know, I wouldn't, I'm not for a minute suggesting this is right or wrong, but I wouldn't suggest a candidate at an early stage say, I'm planning for a baby, or this is what I want to do. I would say, have that initial meeting first, get a feel for the people, the firm allow them to get a feel for you. Okay. And once you can see if that chemistry is right at that stage, leave it to your, your headhunter, if you trust them to communicate that. I would not advise them to communicate that because it's very easy when you're in a room with a you know a panel of partners or ser senior and serious people in a business to feel quite pressured and cornered and your delivery of that kind of information might not always be you know as effective whereas if it's people that are very experienced in doing that and, and dealing with those scenarios they'll do a, a, a you know a good job for you mm. Yeah, absolutely. So the, the flip to that almost is what questions are people not asking that you think they ought to be asking? I don't Smear, you're still on my screen. Oh, go on, Phil. No, you go first. <laughs> right. I, don't, I, um, I don't think people ask enough about to, to really help them understand what they're getting themselves into from a culture point of view and from point of view of the people they're going to be working with and the team that they're going to be slotting into all the data says that that your relationships your allegiances um are to your team not the firm in the end because that is the team where that, that you spend all your time with so people need to ask more about that and what what that looks like what the people look like particularly the people who are running it um, and how that you know how the di the dynamics work, um, they they tend to get hung up on obvious stuff like what's the package, you know, and and oh that's the mate that's the big thing actually. But um, I think they they should do more work around that almost like cultural due diligence. Um, I mean we we will help them with that. I mean we'll volunteer it if if it's particularly if it's a retained project where we know the client really well. Um, because it's in our interest for this thing to work. We wouldn't want to put someone in somewhere if we don't think it's going to work, because that just reflects badly on everyone. 
Mm -hmm. um, but I do think that's a because ultimately it, where these things break down, they don't break down over money. You know, the reason why people leave jobs, it's not about money on the whole. It's 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 about do I feel valued? Is my contribution valued? Do people listen to me? Do I like the people around me? Do I like my boss? So that's the bit that you've got to really explore before you get into it. Mm, that, that's a really great point. And I, I'm sure it was you, Phil, you shared a story with me that you'd met a candidate who thought they wanted a certain thing. And actually, once you'd met them and knew what they were about, you actually said, I know a firm that would suit you. You know, their culture yeah. would suit you really oh, yeah. well. Yeah. And I thought that was fantastic, you know, yeah. that you have that knowledge, um, you know, and, and that's why coming to an expert like yourselves is, is always going to be worth yeah. it because you know the yeah. different firms, you know the cultures, and maybe by meeting the person, you can say, I think this would be a good fit for you. Yeah, and interestingly, that person also wanted to go into a scenario where they had flexible working and reduced hours. So they, they not only did we get them the right culture, but we'd also got them the, the reduced hours and flexible working. Mm. Yeah, ex exactly. So I think that that's that that was the part that speaking to you both, I also thought was really invaluable about the services that you offer, because you're really looking at that person individually and what they might suit, and then knowing the sorts of positions that would suit them culturally and things as well. So yeah. that's that's really useful. It's what Samaya talked about knowing the market. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Samaya, do you think there are any questions that candidates are not asking, and they should be? Um, I think the one thing, um, certainly at the senior end, is knowing more about the financial landscape at sort of years two, three and four as well. I think that sometimes um, candidates can feel a little bit awkward about that or they can be a little bit too focused on the short term. So I might approach them about an opportunity which offers them in the grand scheme of things a fairly marginal pay increase. But a, you know a plethora of other very good career making opportunities and sometimes they need to take the time to think and I you know I will of course counsel them on this to say can you give me an idea of what the financial picture will look like for me with an equity stake at years two three and four um, I also think at the senior end it's always worth doing your due diligence on the company's financial position unless of course it's you know a very very big organization but you know, at the senior end um, particularly if there's a, an equity buy-in, then that's something you should be thinking about. So I think at the, the junior end, candidates should not feel like they are being um, over-ambitious or unrealistic in asking actually what how linear might my trajectory be here if I'm doing all the things you want me to do and you offer me a position once I qualify, you know what what at what stage of my career can I expect to make associate? When can I expect to make senior associate? And when might I start to be able to think about partnership? Um, and by far and away, I think what they should be asking is what access do I have to mentors and champions? You know, there's a, a great book, which is um, Forget the Mentor, Find the Champion. And it's all about how you can further your career by, you know, a significant way if you have somebody that's personally vested in your career. And a lot of the very big firms, certainly in the city at the moment, are offering that as a resource. But it's important that they ask that question. Um, because it, it sort of touches upon what Phil was saying about culture as well, um, in that they've got somebody who they can ask questions to, who they can think about business planning with, who they can think about career strategy with. Um, and it, you know, it, it, it will just give them a great deal of support as well, I think. Mm. Yeah. That's brilliant. So useful. I, I, I want to thank you both so much because um, I've really enjoyed this for a start um, and I hope you have as well. But also, I think this is going to be so, so valuable for people um, at many different stages in their career um, to, to hear the topics we've been talking about and your advice. And also, I hope just get a sense that there are recruiters out there who work in the way that you two do, which is, you know, really supportive, really encouraging, there to help people on their career path and with their career planning, um, you know, and uh, I hope that's useful for people to know. Um, do you have any last final tips? So for, for any of our lawyers who are watching, thinking, you know, am I at a crossroads in my career? Do I need to make a decision either now or soon about my career? What would your final tips be for them? Can I, can I just say one thing on that, and, um, and particularly on the recruitment point of view, recruiters get a lot of very, very bad press, and rightly so in some instances, and you know, it can be like the wild, wild west out there. 
But if you are at that crossroads where you are thinking, you know, I, I want to start to see what other options, I think the worst thing you can do is either, you know, give your CV to lots and lots and lots of different recruiters and just lose complete control over really what is your career on a piece of paper you've got to think that one of the most important things is brand capital in the market and i think certainly most practice areas certainly in my experience in the city it's fairly incestuous every employment lawyer will know you know every other employment lawyer and you don't want your details in the inbox of every person i think you really do need to partner with somebody who's going to be consultative receptive you know, that knows the market inside out that has that is able to give you a track record of assignments they've done in that space and with the clients that you're interested in and who can give you very good counsel on you know what various options are open to you and if it's not an area they know they just need to put their hands up and say i don't recruit in that area but let me pass you on to someone that does mm, it's your that's, career that's brilliant thank you thanks for that one phil your last tips I, I would agree completely with, completely with what Samaya just said. I think it is a case of find an advisor. In the same way, if you were a sports star or an actor or a movie star, you'd have an agent and you would only work with that one agent. It's the same for professionals. You should be the same, find someone. They're out there. You, you, with a bit of time and a bit of networking, you'll find someone that you like and trust. Um, so find an agent to talk to and be having a dialogue with them constantly. doesn't mean you're going to move. Just be talking to them. And then the other thing is finding a mentor inside the business because that can make all the difference between achieving what you want and not. And it doesn't have to be a formal program. It's just finding someone who you can relate to who is happy to help you progress and develop your career. Yeah. Mm. Really, really brilliant advice. Yeah. Um, and then Phil, I just want to finish on that fantastic quote of yours again. Remind us of what your <laughs> quote was, because it was just brilliant. <laughs> Being a lawyer is a great career, but a terrible job. <laughs> I love it. I love it. And yeah, thank you again, both of you so much. Um, really appreciate your time. And um, if anybody's watching the recording and does have any extra questions for you both, if they send them through to me and then I'll, I'll yeah. see if I can have a chat with you both and get some answers to those questions as well. Um, but thank you both again. And uh, thank you to everybody who, who catches our recording and I'll see you all soon. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Bye. 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 Thank you.